Well, let's get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to our first ever live session of our first ever live conference. Um, you are in Bevan Cohen's Making Herbal Teas, Tinctures, and Salves live Q&A. Uh, hopefully, you already had a chance to watch the pre-recorded video on seedsavers.org slash conference. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. I was just walking along with my colleague Catherine yesterday, and she started pointing out purple clover and said, Bevan eats that in his salads. And then per points to this next flower and said, did you know this is chicory? And then we go along and here's some goldenrod. He's, and she says, many people think they're allergic to goldenrod, but they're actually allergic to ragweed. So Bevan, I know I already have proof that you've been educating people with this video. Uh, it's been really great. Um, thank you all so much for being here and thank you Bevan for taking the time to do this Q&A. Uh, a seed librarian and herbalist, she's got a couple books out and great conversationalist. I am looking forward to uh, hearing all the questions and answers today. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Bevan and let him uh, introduce himself and then we'll start taking some questions. Oh, thanks Janine. Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is Bevan Cohen and I'm from Small House Farm uh, over here in Michigan. Um, I'm super excited about this. I guess first I should say thanks to the Seed Savers Exchange for inviting me to be a part of their first virtual conference. I've attended their conference in the past in person and it is probably one of the most fun things I do every year. It is such a great group of people. It is such a groovy event. Um, I love it. So it's, it's cool for me to continue to be able to participate in this new virtual wonderland that we all find ourselves in. Um, it, it's so cool to see so many folks. Um, I've actually got my computer on the view so I can see all the little boxes so I can see everyone. So it's just like we're all here together. And uh, that's that's pretty neat for me. Um, so I guess that's all I'd like to say about that. I think we should move right into the Q&A. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed the video. It was tons of fun to watch. I should give a lot of credit to my wife, Heather. Um, she's the one that really did all of that. I just stood at the table and talked, right? And she edited it and made it sound nice and did all the work. She's, she's, a, a, she's a wonder woman for sure. Um, but enough of that. Um, thank you all for joining us and let's, let's get into your Q and A please. All right. Well, thank you, Bevan. And, uh, I will go ahead and say anyone who wants to ask a question, either raise your hand or start typing your questions in. And it looks like Kate M is already asking a question. Thank you, Kate. Um, Bevan, the first question is how and when do you use tincture versus oil diffusion? Oh, that's a good question. So I use a tincture for the most part um, internally when we're looking for um, a really potent uh, medicinal application. You know, uh, an oil is going to be most likely used topically. We do use some herbal oils, I guess, in the kitchen for, for a flavor thing. But most of our herb infused oils, um, even if we leave them as oils and not craft them into salves or other products, are generally topical. Whereas with tinctures, we use them internally. Um, and again, they're significantly more potent, as we mentioned in the video. Um, so I actually like to, to dilute them in some tea or water when I ingest them, just to make them a bit more palatable. Great. Thank you, Bevan. Um, looks like we have a question from Janet. Janet, I am going to ask you to unmute um, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I understand it's not a big concern. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Okay, uh, but with some oil infusions, you read about usually garlic, but sometimes herbs cultivating botulism. And I just wanted to get your um, opinion about the dangers and how to avoid it. Sure, that's a great question, actually. So garlic in particular is a concern for that because of the, the botulism microorganism actually already existing on the garlic. Um, and it, it involves the process of oxidation as well. So like I mentioned in the video, how important it is to make sure that your herbs are properly submerged in that oil. That's one of the reasons for that. Um, a, a, a visual that you'll see right away when you know your products have started to go bad is the mold that will begin to form on the product that is exposed to the air. It's that exposure to oxygen that causes our problem. So making sure that your, your, your plant products are well submerged in the oil, even if you have to use a small weight. I've done that in some scenarios on, on very persistent herbs that want to float um, to keep them submerged and then make sure you store your herbs in a cool, dark place. If you're working with garlic in particular, you're going to want to put that oil in the refrigerator and you're going to want to keep a limited shelf life. I'm talking 
two weeks with the garlic and the oil, and then you're going to want to get that plant out of the oil itself and not let it sit in there much longer than that. Okay, thanks. You're very welcome. All right, next we have a question from Chelsea. She says, uh, any tips for use with children? Oh, sure. Um, children are the most difficult patients that we deal with sometimes because they can be a bit persnickety with their flavors. Um, now, with tinctures and children, a lot of people are opposed to the concept of, of well, giving their children alcohol, right? Um, now, when I was a kid, I don't think that that was as big a deal as it is nowadays. So I leave that open to a personal preference on how you prefer to do that. But folks that are adverse to giving their children alcohol, which technically I believe the law says you should be, um, you can make an extract with glycerin, um, which is not going to be as potent as a tincture, but it's certainly going to be as, uh, it's relatively as effective, um, but it will be an alcohol-free option. Um, I also find with children that the addition of honey to everything seems to help. Um, my kids, if it's sweet, they seem to be more attracted to it than if it's bitter. Um, so adding a little bit of honey to stuff works. I mean, that works on me too, right? Um, but that, that tends to help with children as well. Also, you'll want to, whatever your recommended dosage is for an adult, you want to start at approximately a third of that for children, especially tiny kids. They have very small systems and they obviously need less medicine than adults do. Great, thank you. Um, Gary Woods, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, sure. Uh, my question was, uh, does the strength of the alcohol uh, matter? Uh, I'm thinking that on one of my trips back from Dakar, my, I call it my annual hodge. And uh, I, picked, I stopped in Postville and picked up a bottle of the uh, High Proof Everclear, thinking to use that for tinctures. And uh, I'm guessing that would work, but uh, what am I missing? Go ahead. That's a great question, Gary. Uh, you, that high proof Everclear is absolutely gonna work just fine. Um, really, your extraction period is gonna be less just because of the, the higher quantity of alcohol that, it, that you're using for your menstruum. Um, in, in most of those situations, you'll find that when you wanna use the tincture, that you're gonna wanna dilute it um, just because of how potent it is. Uh, I always recommend 100 proof just simply because it's 50% alcohol and 50% water essentially. So you get a really nice even extract that way. If you're using Everclear, you can actually even in your extract dilute it. So you would make your uh, one to two tincture like we talked about with the ratios in the video. And then when it's finished, when you bottle it up, you could actually dilute it at that point to have it um, be ready to go to ingest with without having, you know, so that way you don't dilute it every time you use it. You can just do it once and, and call it good. Does that make sense, Gary? Yeah. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. I, somebody put up a, uh, I said in Canada, they can only buy 80 proof. And in fact, in New York, you can't buy the full strength Everclear either. Yeah, here in Michigan, I don't believe that you can buy Everclear. We can go to Ohio to get it, I think. Um, but we're not able to get that in Michigan either. Um, but when you're dealing with resins, um, it, you know, uh, let's say myrrh, pine resin, something like that, those higher proof alcohols are actually going to give you a better medicine just because it does take more alcohol to extract from that uh, sticky tacky type of material. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. <clears throat> the next question I have is from Mindy um, asking, can you use fresh herbs with tinctures and infusions? Sure you can. Um, now, I mentioned in the video that I prefer to use dried herbs, and that's simply because, you know, the water content in the plant material, some plant materials obviously have a higher water content than others, and that's gonna degrade the shelf life of our final product, right? Having too much water in it. Um, so I prefer to use dried plant material. Some plants, especially like flowers, things like that, when I use them, I'll leave them sit out in the sun, at least for a few hours to kind of wilt for some of that water to work their way out of that. Um, but if, if fresh plant material is what you have, absolutely you can use it. If you say, for an example, let's talk about lemon balm, right? Uh, Melissa Ficinalis. If you make a fresh tincture of lemon balm, it's actually a more vibrant color than if you were to make a lemon balm tincture from a dried plant material. Um, so, you know, some of the essential oils and chemical constituents are more concentrated in a dried plant material. That's why, like, when you make tea, you use less herbs if it's dry. It, the, that principle is the same for with tinctures. 
So while you certainly can use fresh herbs, I always recommend using dried. Great, thank you. Michelle Bloom, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and ask your question. All right, hey Bevan. Um, Hello. Excited to see that you mentioned jewelweed. So we have a property and we have poison ivy everywhere. And I've heard that jewelweed is a great preventative, but um, I've been able to identify the plant, but I'm not sure what parts to use. Um, and then if you dry it before you create an oil infusion and what type of oil works best for that? Well, this is a great question, Michael, especially right after talking about dried or fresh herbs. You know, jewelweed is almost the exception to that rule. Um, when, we're, when we're working with jewelweed, the, the part of the plant that's the most potent for poison ivy is actually the juice, the sap that you'll find inside of that stem when you break that open. That's what we're looking to harness as far as a poison ivy medication goes. So this herb, you're gonna to wanna to use it fresh if you can. Harvest it fresh, that juice is fat soluble. So you can mix it into an oil to make a salve or a soap. Um, I have friends that have made a jewelweed soap that was actually very effective. Um, but what I find to be the best way to handle jewelweed for poison ivy, if you're gonna be able to keep it if, for use at your home, harvest that fresh plant material, uh, run it through the blender and put it in ice cube trays, right? Okay. And they'll freeze in a little ice cubes and you can pull them out. It'll be pretty much the dose that you need in each ice cube. It's easy to apply. It's cooling and refreshing when you put it on and it's very, very effective. Indigenous populations would actually take jewel weed um, and break the plants open and rub it on themselves as a preventative before they went out in the bush to harvest things um, to help keep the oils from the poison ivy off of their skin. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Great. Um, I've got a question from Julie V saying essential oils can degrade plastic dropper parts. Can tinctures and oil diffusions also do this? Well, essential oils for the most part are pretty caustic. She's right. And, and they will degrade through your plastic. Now, it, it, unless you're used in Everclear, like Gary might be, um, that's not really a concern that we would have to have. You know, we're not likely to be storing our, our herbs long enough to worry about that. But as I mentioned in the video, I recommend using glass whenever possible. Just, I like to avoid plastic. It's a personal preference of mine. Um, but really, I, I shy away from the use of essential oils in general. Um, if we just think about the amount of plant material that it takes to produce essential oil, um, I, I find it difficult to wrap my head around the sustainability of that practice. So in my personal herbalism work, I, I've come to the conclusion that for centuries, people have made medicine for their families and their communities from the herbs available to them far before the advent of essential oils. And I think that we can continue along that route, producing just as effective medicine without using up quite as much plant material. There's my soapbox for that, sorry. Great. Uh, Spencer Carter is asking, do you have any oils you do not use and why? Um, a second part of the question is, do you have any other characteristics of the oils you choose other than the mechanical pressing you mentioned in your video? I, I don't understand the second question, so we'll answer the first question and then maybe he can clarify what he, he's asking in that second one, just so I can make sure I answer it right. Um, but with the first question, there are some oils that I don't use. I don't use soybean oil. Um, I don't buy, uh, use anything that you could buy from the grocery store labeled as vegetable oil, um, typically because it is soybean based. And soybeans are almost exclusively chemically extracted. And I try to shy away from chemical e extraction. Um, so, you know, as we mentioned in the video, the, they use hexane to extract these oils. And while it's more profitable that way, your extraction rate is significantly higher. I'm adverse to the concept of putting these chemicals on my body or in my body, on my friends, that sort of thing. Um, so I really work towards expeller pressed oils. Um, we press a number of oils that we use here at Small House. We have an oil press. Um, and, and so that, I guess, has changed my philosophy a lot on the oils that we use. You know, as you saw in the video, I did use some olive oil, and that's obviously fine and it's easily accessible to folks. Um, but I like to, I prefer to use oils that we press locally. Um, if we can get it from a local grower, that's great. I've gotten hemp seeds from Canada that we press, um, that sort of thing. But I also don't like to use, well, let's say grapeseed oil. So here in Michigan, you know, we have a, a thriving wine industry and, and grape seeds are something that's actually readily accessible to me and they're locally grown and it kind of, you know, checks all those boxes. But 
the oil content of a grapeseed is so low that the only way to properly extract a useful amount of it is with ridiculously high heat, right? And when you expose your, your seeds and nuts to this high heat to extract that oil, you lose pretty much all the value. All the nutritional value is lost in that heat. And grapeseed oil, the only thing that it actually retains is vitamin E. And you know, vitamin E is great for the skin, so it's wonderful topically, but sunflower seed oil is also just as high in vitamin E, as well as a number of other nutrients that are great for my skin. So for me, that's an obvious choice that we would choose the most beneficial oil that I can produce right here at home. Um, so I think that answers that first question. What was the second question now? Uh, and I got a message that this that you answered the full question. So thank yeah, you. Look at, look at me go, huh? <laughs> Good work. Um, so the next question is coming from an iPhone of without a name. Um, what single herbs would you suggest to a new person making teas? Oh, iPhone, that's a great question. Um, so I would say, obviously, you would want to start with whatever herbs are accessible to you. You know, look at your gardens and see what maybe you're already growing. Look at your yard and see what nature's already provided for you. That, that seems like a wonderful place to get started. Um, you know, Mother Nature's just dropping gifts at our feet everywhere that we go. And, and a, a great number of them would probably make delicious teas. If you're adverse to that for some reason and you'd prefer to purchase from your local providers or from your grocery, um, start with something like mint. Mint is, you know, delicious. Everybody likes that. Sage is a wonderful herb. Uh, salvia, you know, from the Latin to save. And they would say, why would a man die who has sage in his garden? Right? So that's obviously an herb to work with. I think it's delicious. It's far more useful than just in stuffing on Thanksgiving. Um, it makes a, a delicious tea. I've been making tea with oregano. Uh, it's a warming tea. It's wonderful in the wintertime in particular. It's got a nice spicy uh, flavor to it. So really, anything that you have is, is worth trying. Uh, maybe some calendula or some echinacea. They're all beautiful. But you can start with some culinary herbs. So just go to the, you know, the herb section of your grocery and look at some of those things. Whatever appeals to you, some rosemary, whatever it might be. Take it home. Give it a try. Spend some time with it. You know, uh, rub the leaves between your hands and smell the aroma. Steep some for a little bit and just write down your thoughts. Get your notebook out and write down your thoughts as you're trying the tea. And uh, the herbs will kind of guide you where you need to be, really. Beautiful. It looks like there is a question here from Anne, um, and this might go back to the garlic question. So I apologize for not seeing this before. Um, uh, Anne is asking, isn't botulism anaerobic? Um, is this, and let me know if I should skip over this if we're past that question. That's a good question, actually, okay. you know, um, and yes, you're right. But from, from my understanding, from what I've read, so that should be, I guess, the disclaimer here, because um, I don't want anybody to get sick following my advice. But from my understanding, from what I've read, is that proper submersion of the garlic in the oil and limited exposure to the fat is the way to avoid a botulism issue when infusing garlic and oil. Now, we typically only use garlic oil uh, topically. Right? We use it for ear drops, for ear infections and that sort of thing, not to ingest. Um, so I guess in those scenarios, I don't have to be quite as cautious, I guess. Um, but from my understanding, limited exposure to fat, cool refrigerated temperatures, and proper submersion of the garlic is the best way to avoid that from happening, if that helps. Great. Thank you. Um, we have Ms. Mary asking, is there a medicinal difference from orange calendula versus other varieties? for example, strawberry calendula? And also, how do you clean the flowers to get rid of bugs after harv harvesting and before using? Okay, so I don't have an experience with there being much of a difference. Now, when, when we're harvesting, this year we're growing, uh, it's a mixed batch of calendula, it's all sorts of different colors, it's absolutely gorgeous. But I have found that when I'm harvesting the orange calendulas, they're significantly more sticky on my fingers meaning that they have a lot more resins and therefore I would assume to be more medicinal. And I don't get as much of that off of the lighter colored flowers or even some of the red ones. So on, on that anecdotal evidence would lead me to believe that the calendula, uh, the orange calendula may be a bit more potent. Um, I also know that with yarrow, the wild white flowered yarrow is significantly uh, more medicinal than cultivated colorful yarrow that you can buy at the greenhouse. And that's because as we breed plants for particular traits, as we focus on these, these traits, sometimes we lose some of the attributes of other traits. So it's through that selection in the yarrow that has brought us to that place. So based on those two bits of evidence would take me to the place to say that 
I believe that the traditional orange calendula officinalis is going to be the best choice. But if all you have is the strawberry, certainly use it and see how it works for you. Um, it, it, it never hurts to try. It's not as many hard and fast rules in Mother Nature as there is opportunities for experimentation. Great. Um, and it looks like another question came in at the very same time asking that same question, but also uh, two further questions of what is the most effective ratio when making calendula oil? Um, and also, do you include the whole flower? I do include the whole flower. Um, and I almost use like a one to one ratio, you know, almost like a 50 50 of, of flour to oil. Um, and I, I used to take the time to, to remove the petals from the head and go through all this effort um, because I thought that it was the petals were the part of the plant that I was most interested in and I kind of wanted to, 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 to be as effective as possible. And what I came to realize is all of those little buds, the flower heads left behind when I would be taking them out to the compost and stuff, they were so sticky and resiny um, that I was wasting all sorts of good medicine taking it out there. So using the entire whole flower is, is, is a great idea. And the previous question about bugs, I guess, what we do is we'll harvest all the flower heads and then I've got what's essentially it's screen doors, numerous stacks of screen doors kind of on a rack, right? With some fans on it and we use that to dry the herbs. So we'll put all the flowers out on these screens to dry and through the drying process, the bugs just inevitably move on to other things. You know, so that's, bugs are kind of a, a, a non-starter. We don't seem to have that issue because they find better things to do with their time. Once the flowers are dried out, they're not as useful to the plant or to the bug anymore, I suppose, and, and off they go. Great, thank you. Um, Laura is asking, does the medicinal value of an herb change over the life cycle of a plant? Uh, for example, spring versus fall harvesting um, or first year versus second year of a biennial herb? That's a fantastic question. Oh man. So yes, it, it certainly does. So, and let's break down the life cycle of the plant and let's think about where it's putting its energy into. So if we're looking to harvest uh, the, the roots, the below ground portions of the plant, we want to harvest them in the late fall, early spring, you know, before the plant has started to move its energy up into the aerial portions. When it, when it starts to put all of its, its um, juice, so to speak, down into the roots to, to be dormant for winter time, that's when we want to harvest those roots. Conversely, for the aerial portions of the plant, when the plant is at just at the beginning of its flowering stage, tends to be when the, the, the most concentration of essential oils are in the aerial portions of the plant. So right as it's starting to bud, just as it begins to bloom, is the best time to harvest that. And then using that logic, then, we would come to understand that in a biennial, then, it would be that second year plant would be the most beneficial for us to harvest. All right, unless we want the leaves. Yeah, so as I'm saying it out loud, I'm thinking, so like mullen is one that I think of. Mullen is a biennial and it grows that rosette, all those really very soft leaves, right? And then that second year, it puts out that flower stalk. Obviously, if I'm looking to harvest the flowers, I have to wait for that second year. But for the leaves, that first year is a perfectly good time to harvest that rosette at the peak of its life. So like mid-summer, those mullen leaves are gonna be great to harvest. Great, thank you. Um, Kimberly is asking, when creating an echinacea tincture, do you dehydrate the root and then create the tincture with the dried herb? Kimberly is thinking immune system strength this year. Yeah, certainly. Now, we, we would do that if we were using echinacea roots. Um, you would harvest the roots, you'd want to clean them. So you'd want to wash them, get all that dirt and stuff off of them first. Um, I, I would then at that point kind of chop them up bust them up into smaller parts and lay them out to dry. It's, uh, they're gonna dry a lot better that way. If you leave it too whole, especially the larger, older roots, they're gonna kind of mold. They're not gonna dry as well. So if you can cut them up into smaller pieces, lay them out to dry. I have a friend that sometimes uses um, his oven. He'll put them on a very low heat with his oven door cracked and dry them that way. Um, but I, I'm too forgetful to do that sort of thing. So I just lay them out on the screens and that seems to work just fine for me. But in recent years, I have actually I only harvest my echinacea roots um, to kind of push back the population so it doesn't take over. I, I've been using the aerial portions of my echinacea medicinally, um, and the whole stalk, leaves, flowers, all of it. Um, and I'll chop that all up and I've been tincturing that 
Um, and I find that it's, it's been very, very effective for us. Um, much easier for me to produce. Um, and like I said, it's just as effective. So yeah, I, I kind of err on the side of ease. I do the same with elderberries. I've been using elder flowers. The, the chemical components in the elderberry that are antiviral um, can also be found in the flower. They're a lot easier to harvest. I don't have to battle the birds from them for them. Um, valerian, I've been doing the same thing. A lot of folks use valerian root. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a very calming herb. Valerian root will help put you to sleep. It stinks like the worst thing you've ever smelled. It tastes awful. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, I've been using the flowers. It's floral. It's almost delightful. Um, and it will, it's a little more gentle. You know, if you use valerian root and you wake up next day, you almost have like a hangover sometimes from it. It's really, really drags you down. Um, and I don't have that issue with the flower. Um, so there's definitely some places where we traditionally um, may have read about root uses, where sometimes there's some alternatives to that that are even easier, especially for the beginning herbalist. Great. Um, Kate M says that you mentioned that people are generally not allergic to goldenrod, but are allergic to ragweed. Um, but the two plants look similar. Could you explain to a novice how to tell the difference between the two plants? Sure. Um, hmm. Now, my experience with those two plants, let me, let me try to think about how I would describe the differences. The inflorescence is very different. The flower is, is in my mind, they're dramatically different plants. Um, and that maybe we needed a side-by-side -side comparison to be able to, to identify them. But the leaf structure is certainly different. Um, the flower structure is different. I, to me, I would have a hard time actually confusing those two plants for each other. Uh, but that's just because of my immersion in that. Um, it, so to somebody looking to find that, let's, let us start with the leaf structure. The leaf structure of a golden rod is, it's, I think they're serrated, they're uh, oval shaped, whereas a ragweed's more of a fan shaped leaf. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm lacking on the words to describe these things. Uh, but they're, they're very different leaf structures and very different flower structures. A golden rod's flowers will generally be a beautiful golden cascade at the top of the plant um, where there'll be typically one large flower head, whereas a ragweed will have multiple more cone-shaped flowers that'll appear on the plant. Um, there, there's, a, there's a number of differences. So I recommend that she should maybe, um, that'd be a good Google search or an opportunity to, to buy a book um, that would, would walk us through those descriptions. But once she takes the time to properly identify those plants, it'll be very easy for her to identify them again in the future um, because they are quite different. Right. Um, Marsha is asking about lemongrass for tea and what you know about that. Um, Marsha has heard that it's good for arthritis. I can't speak to that specifically, lemongrass for arthritis, um, but I do know that it is a delicious tea. Uh, I got a lemongrass bush from a lady outside of Cincinnati a couple years ago that we actually, we have to bring it into the house here in Michigan to keep it going, um, but it's delicious for tea. Um, we make soups and such with it, so we've, we've studied the herb from a culinary standpoint, but as far as its anti-inflammatory actions, I'm not as familiar with it. Um, but I'd be curious to ask her if she was using it for arthritis topically, or if she was simply ingesting it. Because if she's drinking it and enjoying the anti-inflammatory benefits, I would then assume that she could use it topically and it would be even more potent. More potent. And in that case, I would use it as a salve or, or you know, a fat soluble application would probably be a wonderful direction to go with that. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Susie Klein is asking, the, what is the best way, tea or tincture, to make herbal medicine for oral health, specifically for the gums? For the gums. I would say tea. Um, I, I would use a tea for something like that. I, you know, a tincture, a tincture with an alcohol is, is very drying, um, you know, and, and for the most part with oral health, we're, we're not looking to dry out our gums by any means. Um, sage would be a wonderful herb that I would just off the top of my head say um, that I have experience with for that sort of thing. A very potent. So whereas in the video, we made a tea for our water infusion where we infused it for, you know, I think it was like just a couple of minutes. So you can you get the smell and the aroma and the color and it's a delicious beverage. For something like this, we would want to infuse that overnight. So you would want to pack your jar with sage. A little bit of myrrh. If you could get some myrrh, 
if you have a dealer that's got myrrh, myrrh is great for gum pump. Uh, but if you don't have any myrrh, resin, obviously sage is e easy to get your hands on. Pack your jar with sage, um, tight, really tight, and fill it up with water. So it's a very, very potent. Cap that off, put it in the refrigerator for like 12 to 24 hours. You want like a very potent medicinal extraction, right? And then use that as a mouthwash. You know, rinse your mouth out with that after you brush your teeth and stuff. Um, and that would be a wonderful, you know, it's astringent, but not dry. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's, it, it's antiseptic, it's antibacterial. It, it would be a wonderful herb for a mouthwash for, for oral health, certainly. Great. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about this already, but I'll go ahead and ask this in case you have anything to add. Um, Tracy is asking the best way to wash and clean ma plant material before drying it um, and saying that that uh, they always worry that they're washing off useful compounds and oils. Well, you know, in something like calendula, like what you spoke of, um, too much washing is certainly gonna wash some of those resins off and that could be an issue. Um, but with those types of plants, you can just harvest them. The flowers, you know, they're up off the ground. They're, they're relatively clean. You can pick those guys, put them out to dry on your screens and that shouldn't be an issue. If you're dealing with something that's dirty, like we were talking about those roots or something like that, you can literally brush your roots are tough. You can take a brush and scrub that dirt, get it right off of there. If you take some of the outer layers of that, the, the skin off the roots, that's no big deal at all. Um, wash them up real good, blot them with some towels or something to get any excess moisture off and then put them out to dry. Uh, if you're concerned about it also at that late, you can you put a fan on it even, get some airflow blowing. Um, that'll help dry them off real quick. If you're dealing with leaves, I guess, that are low growing or that have been, you know, it got dirty somehow or whatever, you can give them a quick rinse, spray them off with the hose, whatever, maybe your kitchen sink. Um, but again, you're going to want to blot them dry to get any excess moisture off of them that you can before you lay them out to dry. Um, but then at that point, they should be fine. Great, thank you. Um, Wanda would like to know if you've ever tinctured or oil infused eye bright. Oh, I have not, Wanda. Um, that's not an herb that we work with here at Small House yet. Um, what is it that you were planning to do with it? Do you have something in mind? I would like to hear from you about that actually. Wanda, are you there for further comment? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oops. I think you're muted still here. Let me see if I can help you out. Um, there we go. I'm asking you to unmute from my end. Here we go. Yeah, okay, go ahead with your question, Anna. I'm in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota area, and I know they've had some Hudsonian eyebright, which is along the Lake Superior shores, that's um, supposedly more medicinal than the inland European style eyebright. And my sister uh, down in Kansas was having some clouding issues or floaters, things like that, and I had heard that eyebright had been used in the past in older herbalism uh, for an eye wash or to take internally to clear up these kinds of symptoms and wondered if you had experienced anything in your area or knew any more about the eye bright, um, uh, you know, uh, endangered species aspect of it. You know, Wanda, that's a good question and I don't have a specific answer to that. I would assume that internally though, with you would go on maybe with the tincture form but with an eye wash specifically, obviously just a water infusion is all you'd want to put in your eyes, um, yeah. you know, for certain. But that's that's not something that I'm familiar with, but I'm, I'm going to look into that more. And that's way cool, Wanda. That's a groovy question because I, what a great example that is um, of how everything that we do is an opportunity to learn something new. Um, you know, I've been studying plants for, for as, as long as I can remember it, right? Um, but there's always something new to learn about. Um, we're always the student and never the master, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's groovy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, iPhone user is asking, is there a resource for recommended weight volume ra ratios? Well, I, I will shamelessly plug my own book um, that's coming out soon, um, The Artisan Herbalist, which is available for pre-order right now at theartisanherbalist.com. Um, you know, I'm a little biased, but I think it's an excellent reference. 
Um, but if you can't wait for it to come out and you need some info right now, um, I would suggest find seven song, uh, seven like the number song, seven song, all one word on the internet. Um, his website and resources are some of the most, I mean, his, his website's just packed full of so much information, but it's so user friendly. Um, anybody can visit this website and, and understand the way that he presents this information and you'll spend all afternoon learning stuff. So seven songs website's a good way to go. Um, Jim McDonald's a pretty good character. Um, I don't know if he's got a website specifically, but if you search Jim McDonald herbalist, you'll find something and, um, anything by Susan weed, I recommend as well, but for ratio specific formulas, seven songs website is the place to be. Great. Thank you. Uh, Marsha is asking, what is the best way to dry herbs? Uh, she says she uses a dehydrator and has a ring with an S hook in the, to air dry. Um, and that's slower, but is it safe? Oh, sure. You know, uh, we've done bundles of, of drying herbs as well. I think they just look nice too. They look cool hanging around the kitchen and such. But the, the tip with that is you don't want your bundles to be too thick. You know, if, if they're too much plant material in your bundle, the stuff in the middle is not going to get good airflow and that stuff's going to mold before all of your herbs properly dry. Um, so if you're going to do bundles like that, you want to keep them, uh, keep them small. You know, airflow is very, very important. Your dehydrator is going to work really well for that, obviously. It most likely has a fan or something, or the heat at least is moving that air. Um, but we do, like I said, a lot of stuff out on screens. Um, I, I find the screens work really well, just simply that airflow. Cool, dark, good airflow. It's not in the same environment that we dry our seeds in, right? Um, it's the same kind of place that we would want to be drying our herbs. Um, if you've got some fans that you can hook up, that's great. Um, you can get, I mean, window screens off the side of the road are, are a great option. A number of the screen doors that we're using out there, we have some that we fabricated, but I bet half of them are screen doors I literally picked up off the side of the road and they work just fine. Great. Thank you so much. We just have a couple more minutes left here. Um, so if you have any additional questions, make sure to get them in now. Um, I'll point out, it sounds like uh, Tracy also is, is letting us know that there is a free app that you could like point your camera at a goldenrod to try to identify. So that's something that you could potentially look um, into as well. Um, let's see if there are other questions waiting here. Um, Susie is asking, is there a general shelf life for stored dried herbs? Yeah, I say one year. Um, within a year's time, you, you know, your herbs are going to start to, to break down and, and degrade a little bit in quality. Um, and, and anyways, after a year's up, you'll kind of have time, it'll be time to re-harvest those things, regrow those things, and replenish your supply anyways. So if you've got so much herbs that you've got a lot left over, a year from now, that means you're harvesting too much. You're working too much. Um, slow down a little bit. You know, you want to kind of set it up so you can go through your herbs. So when I'm harvesting the new herbs, I'm just getting to the end of that supply. You want to be able to keep your herbs around for about a year. Uh, to quick note on those apps, those are groovy. That's a cool way to get started, uh, but they're not always accurate. Uh, I have personal experience with using some of those here out on our land. Um, and while they're, for the most part, pretty good, sometimes they're not. Um, so with something like goldenrod, it's going to be fine, you know, but in some cases you want to be a little more accurate. Like right? some plants do have some lookalikes that are potentially toxic and you don't want to make a, a fatal mistake of some sort out there because you're trusting an app. Um, so while you can use an app to get you started, you're going to want to further confirm in some situations the identification of these plants before you consume them. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. That's really important. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for all of these great questions. Um, thank you, Bevan, for taking the time to answer them and share your knowledge with all of us. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave us with before we sign off? Well, first, thanks, guys. Man, that was super fun. You guys were wonderful. Uh, let's stay in touch if we can. I mentioned the, the Artisan Herbalist website. If you're interested in the book, Small House Farm, so we can stay in touch with each other any way that you would like. Um, that's got all sorts of clickable, linky things. Um, you know, but really take whatever you picked up from me today and go outside and just sit still for a little bit. Listen to what mother nature says to you, find a plant, pick just one. That's all it takes and get started practicing some herbalism right in your own backyard. Thank you, Janine, for having me. You guys were, this was wonderful.
I think Sorry, I was on mute there. I, I had an almost perfect session. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Thank you so much, Bevan. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Bye.